Ashley Judge, and I'm a volunteer with Springtide Resources. I have been a volunteer with Springtide Resources for over four years now. It's hard to believe time has flown. But uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Springtide Resources, but what Springtide Resources does is uh, we provide resources and information to help prevent abuse and help women who have experienced abuse. And in particular, we work with um, immigrant and refugee populations, young women, and women with disabilities and deaf women. So I am part of the Women with Disabilities program, but I also wanted to say that although I have a rather visible disability, Springtide works with women with all types of disabilities, maybe psychiatric disabilities, intellectual disabilities, or disabilities that are otherwise less visible. So I have to say that initially when I began, or when I was asked to volunteer with Springtide Resources, I was a little bit hesitant because I was hesitant to work with something that, with an organization that served and advocated ex exclusively for females. Because like the previous speakers have said, we often have um, an assumption about who the victim may be and who the perpetrator may be. But men and men with disabilities are also at a higher risk for abuse because of the number of people that they have to let into their lives um, due to the needs that they have because of their disability. But I know that we are here to focus primarily on women today, but I wanted to also say that men are at higher risk for abuse as well. So it's good to, again, like our last speaker said, have that inclusive dialogue. So in the disability, sorry, when we're working with people with disabilities, we may see the different types of abuse, including sexual abuse, and they may be visible. It may be things that readily come to your mind when you think about sexual abuse. You may think of rape or molestation, but there might be things that are less obvious. So for instance, I'm a woman and I rely on other women to do some of my activities of daily living. Uh, I have to let them into my home and do things for me like meal prep, changing my clothes, assisting me with showering. And oftentimes we're taught to, women with disabilities in particular, are taught to ignore our gut instincts. Uh, people might think that somebody who's a caregiver is this sweet angelic person, and some of them are. But uh, some of them may not be. People often don't think that a caregiver may take advantage and abuse someone. So even, I have mostly, I have, sorry, I have all female carers. But what if, for instance, one day that female caregiver spends too much time washing my genitals, for example? I might not say anything, because if I say anything, the message I might get would be, how dare you, this person is here to help you, be grateful. Um, I had an experience another time where, and it wasn't out of malice, but I had an experience where a female caregiver went ahead without asking me and began trying to wash my breasts. And I'm capable of washing my own breasts, so automatically I pushed her hand away. And she scolded me and she said, don't push my hand away. I'm trying to help you. So again, that wasn't out of malice, I'm sure. But think about it. If you get those messages of, oh, I'm trying to help you, don't object, don't give me problems, if there really was a situation where a caregiver was trying to cause uh, a consumer harm or somebody they were caring for harm, we're often taught to ignore those instincts. The reality is that women with disabilities are anywhere from two to ten times more likely to be abused in any way, sexual, physical, emotional. And the reason for that is not because our disabilities make us more vulnerable, but again, we have so many more people we have to let into our lives. We might have a team of anywhere from three to six caregivers coming into our home each week to help us with those activities of daily living. There may be the wheel-trans driver, there may be the physiotherapist, there's a number of service providers that we come into contact with in some very intimate situations at times. 
And again, we're taught to ignore those instincts because people assume that nobody who would take on the role of being a caregiver or a service provider would ever abuse the consumer. And I've also had situations where I have had organizations that I have worked with try to force me and other female clients to work with male caregivers, to work with male personal support workers, and allow these males to do personal care for us. So anywhere from changing us, to bathing us, um, to helping us with feminine care, or even maybe more intimate procedures, depending on what, what the consumer needs are. And it, in this situation, it took all of the clients, all of the female clients, with this one organization coming together to tell the manager that no, we object to having males do our care. And again, males can abuse females, females can abuse females, males can abuse males, but you can't ignore the reality that statistically there is a higher probability when somebody is doing care for somebody who is the opposite gender, there is more likely to be abused. And even so, Imagine if I am a woman who has experienced sexual trauma from a male perpetrator. I might have the nicest male caregiver in the world coming in to do my care, but it's very re-traumatizing, perhaps for me, and I'm being forced to work with this individual. We also had complaints about female caregivers working with male consumers, because again, males may, might suffer abuse too. When I tried to bring it to a female staff's attention that she shouldn't have been regularly taking shifts to care for male clients, and I said to her, you know, the only way you're going to learn is if somebody makes an accusation or something happens and somebody is, God forbid, sexually assaulted or mistreated in some way someday, she told me, no, don't be ridiculous. In this line of work, we can't be held responsible for that if somebody makes an accusation. So again, trying to, we talked a lot about prevention already, trying to prevent those situations where somebody might be at a higher risk for abuse or at a higher risk of being re-traumatized. Try to keep it so that male caregivers are working with male consumers and female caregivers are working with female consumers. And working and looking at that prevention model again that we talked about, People with disabilities often aren't recognized as being sexual beings. We're looked at as asexual, or we're looked at as people who would never get into an intimate relationship. Therefore, a young child with a disability may not be taught about sexual abuse, or a young a youth with a disability might not be taught about what's a healthy relationship and what are healthy boundaries. Furthermore, when somebody is abused, there might be a lack of services to support that person. So, for instance, if I'm a woman that has been sexually abused by my partner and now needs a, a safe shelter to go to, there are very few um, accessible women's shelters in Toronto. I believe there is only two wheelchair accessible shelters in all of Toronto. And that is because people believe that, well, women with disabilities don't come here so they must not face intimate partner abuse. But the reality is women with disabilities don't come to shelters because they can't come to shelters because they can't even get in the front door. So again, there needs to be services that assist women with disabilities or men with disabilities who have been abused. And there needs to be that recognition that people with disabilities do get into, get into intimate relationships and there needs to be that dialogue about what is a healthy relationship and what are the boundaries. And people who are at risk, who are especially at risk, might be those whose disability prevents them from physically speaking. So they may not be able to communicate their needs at all, or they may communicate their needs using perhaps a, an assistive communication device, such as a computer or an alphabet board where they spell what they want to say, or a symbol book, and oftentimes those devices don't have any words for sexual abuse, or it's difficult for people to communicate that they're being mistreated in some way. And again, it's because of that assumption that nobody would ever abuse a person with a disability or a person who's unable to speak 
So I believe that is being improved upon now. I believe a lot of assistive communication devices do have uh, words for body parts so that people can describe. Maybe if they're being mistreated, they can describe what's happening to them. But I'd also like to point out that in situations of trying to prevent abuse, we might be re-traumatizing a person again. I was recently at another conference for Springtide where um, I was asked by a group of parents who had adult children in group homes. They said to me, well, our adult children are unable to speak, so do you think it's a good idea to have cameras in group homes so that we can catch if a caregiver is uh, harming our children. And while I really empathize with these parents' concerns, and I know it is heartfelt trying to prevent abuse, I see a lot of potential for exploitation there. If you're going to be putting cameras in an area where uh, a caregiver is going to be showering somebody or assisting somebody with using the toilet, if there are six different clients in that home, which family gets to view which tape? Do all the families get to view all the tapes of all the clients, or do they just get to view um, the tape with their family member on it? There is a potential, will that get into the internet? And filming somebody when they're undressed without their permission is a form of sexual violence. So that's a good thing to keep in mind too, that sometimes when even though we mean well and we're making our best efforts to prevent abuse, we may in fact be abusing or re-traumatizing somebody.